most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dams. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, altruistic, stupendously fabulous Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us Blackwells. We tend to be involved in many an unusual oddity in Sturgeon. A dash of calamity here, and a heavy helping of depravity there. Nobody ever said we were a boring bunch, that's for sure. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some, well, some of you decided to seek out a bar in between spaces. See, in Sturgeon, there's a bustling entertainment district that houses a vice for almost every occasion. Drugs beyond your wildest dreams, parlors catering to all manner of enjoyments, the eponymous hotel inertia that houses entire realities on every floor, the underground nightmare fighting pit and a bar that shows up to the lost, destitute and broken when they are in need or about to make a key choice. A friendly barman will greet you, offer you a strange concoction in exchange for your story. He'll tell you what you need and, on his recommendation, your path may change. Listeners, we are about to visit that bar and understand one of Sturgeon's great adventures as told by T.J. Lee who feverishly recorded this with a slew of cast members while he was consuming liquefied purple crayons. These will be released episodically with a full-length version coming at the end of it for all of you binge-happy listeners who need our airwaves to attain that higher level of awareness and to keep the bug people off your frequency. We do understand. It's time for our next story of this evening. This tale, A Dark Cloud Followed Me Home, is another recollection of Sturgeon's current events by constant chronicler of the chaotic concealed T.J. Lee. T.J. wants you to do two things, listener. He wants you to follow him on Twitter at T.J. Lee to help feed his fragile ego, and he wants you to pre-order his second novella, The Spaces In Between, out September 30th, because he says his purple crayon wife will not last a winter without, uh, sustenance. I tried asking him what that was, but... He just drew all over my face and said, Not for you to know, green crayon infidel. Mm. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dusklight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. And we must thank the amazing Romnex for really making our thumbnails snazzy lately. We couldn't do it without her celestial assistance. Our cast today features our purple prince of perpetual pestilence, T.J. Lee, all hail his genitorial wisdom. And of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. I'm a professional cloud watcher. The only one left that I know of, in fact. I'm sure there are others, watching their own skies for information and signs, but at least for my little corner of the earth, it's just me. Old Sam the Cloud Watcher, as they call me. Or just the old bull staring up, mouth agape at the sky. That too. But I'm coming here in the hopes that someone else can shed some light on recent occurrences. Perhaps some other cloud watching enthusiast or licensed professional. As the title suggests, One of them has followed me home, and I'm unsure as to how to get rid of it. I realize how strange that sounds, to be a professional cloud watcher. 
After all, isn't it just staring up at the sky? How hard can that be? Sounds relaxing, actually. Well, there's a bit more to it, and it boils down to the same thing any profession requires. Aptitude. While almost everyone loves watching clouds, very few actually see what the clouds mean. What they are concealing, and what that spells for the future of the area those particular clouds are formed over. It's not something you learn. Not at first, anyway. You have to see the patterns naturally before it can be cultivated. You see it all the time in films. A couple or some friends are laying down cloud watching. They see shapes in the clouds like food, animals, or sometimes what they want to see. It's the latter that shows something special. I was always fascinated by the clouds. My father would scold me for constantly daydreaming and losing myself in the skies and subsequently failing my tests at school. But one day, I pointed something out to him in the sky, looming behind a particularly large, bright cloud obscuring the sun. That one there. There's a catcher behind it. You can see its hands peering out from the corner. I think we're going to get a storm soon. My dad looked at me, bewildered, and told me there was no such thing inside the clouds, that he could only see the usual bland shapes and designs. He sent me to bed without dinner, even as I protested that we had to take shelter, shouting to the rest of our family and neighbours until he placated me with promises of a father-son trip if I stopped this cloud nonsense. I awoke that night to the sounds of billowing winds uprooting trees, thunderclaps that burst the eardrums and bursts of horrific ball lightning ripping through the streets below. By the time my family realised what was going on, it was too late. Within 17 minutes, my little town formerly known as Great Salmon had been decimated. It was found in my bed, amid a ton of wreckage, bruised but alive and repeating cloud catcher over and over. I was taken in educated and my gift for cloud watching grew. I was sought out by other small towns for predicting the weather, helping to prepare for threats and what unusual clouds would entail. It's been a good way to live for some time. I get to help others and I get to relax, watching the clouds in the process. The problem is, the latest town I'm helping to cloud watch for has a far more unique weather situation. Most of you will have seen more manner of cloud formations without really considering it for more than a few seconds. Heavy dark clouds rolling in as the storm approaches, a blanket of grey and white obscuring the sun for a chilly day, speedy white battalions giving way to small slithers of radiant blue on a summer's afternoon, and so forth. But what do you do when the clouds you watch don't conform to any of that? What do you do when the clouds bring with them a life of their own? The mayor of this town reached out and implored me to come and visit said that once every summer solstice they were besotted by an unknown weather calamity that came in three stages over three weeks, ending with untold destruction and death to the town. They could never see anything more than just the clouds, but they knew something was lurking up there. They said if I could find out what it was before the final stage, it could save a lot of lives. I could save a lot of lives. How could I refuse to help? And I won't lie, the prospect of something new lurking in the clouds was most certainly enticing. My first day on the job here involved my usual ritual. Park up on the highest hill overlooking the town with an opportune vantage point, drink some Fiji water, and play some Vaporwave while I sat in the hood of my car and took notes. To help put into context what I saw and why I've come for you all today, here's some of the more relevant logs. For the sake of time, I'll only share a handful. Day 1 blue sky, white clouds. One hour. Their density is thick. They march in a structured formation to the west, their generals up front with tendril-like white edges to their almost marshmallow base. They rush past me, but carry no breeze. Small patches of the sun's light eke out from between the bars the clouds keep it behind, permitting next to no contact with the outside world. If I didn't know any better, I'd say the clouds were patrolling the skies, keeping something at bay. Three hours. There's a single conglomerate of blackened clouds rolling in, a gang from another turf, perhaps. They take no prisoners as they bullhorn their way through the nearby docks and capsize a couple of fishing boats in the process, staining the ground with a black, viscous tar. I hear a car nearby swerve and crash. I hope they're okay. I see the thin gap of blue sky rapidly being dispersed, 
the white clouds converging around it as if to defend it. Something in the general clouds begins to stir, and I sense a bitter wind on the horizon. Four hours. It is almost sunset, but there is no lavender sky or palette of beautiful colours to marvel at. Instead, I watch the black clouds push in until they are nearly overhead, their anger felt by every citizen in the town below. So many are covered in the black tar that brought me here, though I didn't believe it when they told me. It cakes the great spires and oozes through the windows. The people here call it the slow rot and won't tell me what it does to anyone who comes into physical contact with it. There's a clear line between the bright and grey clouds and that of the dark ones. Something in the lead black cloud moves and a brilliant spark of red ripples through its body, sparking all the way down the ranks before depositing its contents. A sea of red descends on the town and mixes with the black tar, causing it to bubble and fizz like acid. When it's finished, the clouds depart as quick as they came. I can still hear people screaming as I drive back to my lodge. Day 5. Yellow Sky yellow clouds. One hour. I got here at sunrise, the last few days bringing with them a strange set of stairs that start by the steps of the hill and ascend far beyond the perceivable clouds. There's a smell of barbecues and freshly cut grass in the wind. An attempt at bringing forth nostalgia from within me, perhaps? Who could say? But the sky has concerned me for some time. Why is it yellow? I don't mean it's simply a sunny day, I mean the blue hue that was here from the first day has long since been erased, and in it sits an almost artificial yellow. I can no longer tell where the sunlight is coming from, and something in that realisation is most unsettling. It feels like I've been to an exhibit housing a dangerous creature, and now the cage is either empty or covered with a cloth, and I'm assured it's still there, even when I don't hear anything. I won't lie. I do wish to go up those stairs, but I am not willing to just yet. I must understand what all this means first. Three hours. I must have looked away for no more than 15 minutes in order to check my logs and any info on strange anomalies in the sky, but when I looked back, the stairs had vanished, and the clouds had completely restructured. Great mountainous pillars littered the sky and continued for untold distances in either direction. As my eyes followed to the sender, my jaw dropped and my skin grew taut, bumps forming and every hair standing on end. A small set of buildings and strange structures comprised of a denser, more malleable cloud material hung in the sky overhead, both feeling as if I could reach out and touch it, but also impossibly far above me. I followed from the entrance archway up to a longhouse, the door slowly opening and releasing the light that was missing from the skies. Within, I caught a glimpse of something. I can't be sure what it was, but I know that in the few seconds I locked eyes with it, the colour drained from the clouds, and a chill ran through me that was so biting I had to look away and grab a sweater to cover up. When I looked back, the clouds had become a pallid grey and covered the sky completely. Seven hours, I slept up here. During my dream, I'd floated up to the clouds and stood on the grand archway. The colours were a rich purple and lavender. I felt at ease, communicating with some entities that were neither here nor there. Dream logic, I suppose. They told me they appreciated my willingness to understand them, to study them and help those down below, but that the solstice brings with it a new beginning that cannot be stopped. Still, they said, I must speak with them and see for myself. I was led into the longhouse. It was far bigger in person, fit to hold something several hundred times my own size. The beings didn't venture too close to its interior, seemingly intimidated. As I walked its great halls, obelisks of clouds and shapes of creatures I'd never seen, I found myself at the foot of a throne made from ash and fog, the seat a constant churning thunder. I could not tell you if something was said upon it. My mind has elected to redact that information but I do recall what it said to me in a deep, commanding voice that resonated within my bones. Cloud Catcher Cometh. I went home that night, and I kept my curtains closed. Day 11. 
tall clouds, green sky. I awoke with a start, the sound of cicadas shrieking an efficient alarm clock here. It took me a few seconds to realize that something else was shrieking along with them. As I ventured out to my balcony, I saw the town bathed in a dark hue of green, angelic horns blasting from the depths of the clouds above as a warning siren, but nobody was heeding it below. To my horror, the black clouds had come in from the east. Thick plumes descended from their ranks and congregated in the streets, amalgamated shapes of humanoid creatures clad in storm cloaks and bearing lightning bolts for teeth screeched as they latched themselves to fleeing citizens, devouring them or enshrouding them in their fog. I could do nothing as the black clouds above smashed against the defiant greys and whites, great thunderclaps echoing around us. The grey clouds had formed huge structures with which to create a fortress around the green patch of sky. They refused to let anything near it. The moment of truth came as the largest pillar in the grey sky arched back and swung itself over the ranks of the others, colliding with the black cloud with such force that it split the sky in two, the green sky exposed and eradicating the beasts below. In the spire off to the distance, a woman clad in black had her arms held out wide and her head tilted back, reveling in the green glow. I felt dizzy staring out of the green sky for too long and took myself back to bed the soft crying of the townsfolk weighing heavily on my conscience. I didn't have the heart to tell him what I'd seen. Not yet. Before I share with you this last log, I feel it is important to explain what I believe is being concealed in the skies and who or what is coming after it. It's been a long-standing belief that there are things that lurk within the deep sky. The first humans who crawled out of the caves believed the sun itself was a god to be revered and feared in equal measure as it brought them sunlight and safety each day before the darkness came and brought instead a slew of predators that craved human flesh. So it's no small leap of faith to assume what is being kept in the sky above this town. A sleeping, ancient god. I don't mean a god in the sense of what traditional beliefs hold. I don't believe this is something omniscient or omnipresent. But it is powerful. And it knows that people covet its power. Which leads me on to the black clouds. To the cloud catcher I mentioned before. There have always been people who crave power and will get it by any means necessary. Those who have not the means themselves will frequently utilize methods of force to grab it, using any tools they see as proficient. <laughs> tools like me. Day 18, Crimson Sky, Obsidian Clouds. It is dark when I ascend to the top of the hill, but it is only 10.45 in the morning here. The townsfolk have taken shelter underground or in the churches. I was able to relate to the mayor what the danger was and, in turn, receive their gratitude. I did not guarantee them I could fix the issue, but they seem satisfied to know what is lurking in their skies and what is coming to try and take it. Old towns have old traditions, that much is certain. It is not my place to question them or judge them, especially when I've seen the strangeness for myself. While it can be chalked up to strange chemicals in the air, unusual weather patterns or collective hysteria, my job is to interpret and extrapolate. And that's what I'll do. I'd be lying if I said I knew what the cloud catcher was, but it has been known to me for some time, just as the clouds I'm familiar with have been. I stood atop that hill, vulnerable to the elements and the burning sensation of the crimson sky no white or grey clouds to remain to shield me. The once dark clouds had now adopted an obsidian hue, solid in their structure and single-minded in their resolve to take what they wanted. This time, I did not relent as I watched them, waiting for the large cloud to pass over me. It undulated and split apart, ugly hands and furtive eyes peering over its edges. I don't dare speak of what it looked like further. Giving it further power is not wise. But it saw me, and it remembered me, and I made a deal with it. If it followed me away from this town, from its people who had seen untold ruin and slaughter every summer solstice for centuries, I would give it new places to feed and thrive with its kin. It agreed, and the remainder dispersed, the singular black cloud following me wherever I travel. Now I bid my farewells to the town and travel to my next job. 
a small town not far from this one. Sturgeon. And so it brings me to the present, to sitting in my car on a silent, singular road cleared by thick trees and a blotted out sun that my cloud-catching companion has assured will never shine on me again. My dreams are now fraught with this creature peering over the skies in my sleeping room, determined that it will one day bring me into the clouds and harness my skills for itself. It is always hungry, and I cannot feed it forever. If any of you out there are seasoned cloud watchers or readers of the heavens above, I beg you to offer me your advice before I reach my next destination. Before I reach this humble little town of oddities known as Sturgeon. Please, how do I stop this black cloud from consuming me? The dark cloud is many things to many people, listeners. Some see it as a metaphor for the mental anguish we all suffer through from time to time. Others look at it as an allegory for misery and grief. But in Sturgeon, it is a signifier of things to come. Dangerous things. Only time will tell how bad it may be. But I will tell you this much, dear listener. I am afraid. For the first time in a long time, I am afraid. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions including the Sturgeon playlist. We're adding them regularly and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of foreboding, it's just a normal bell but adding stuff like that is nice, and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many legged runners to find. Dedication needs to be rewarded and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time we give thanks to Wet, Viola Pro, Lady Nevermore, Ryan Kettles, Baron Von Pasta, Amy S, Tyler Olson, Blue Sharpie, Other Unit, New Audio of Alexandria, Rain Lord, Steven Stevens, Jason and Gamma are terrifying twosome at every premiere and Penny Tails Up for giving us their valuable time. Want to get a shout out? Be sure to join our premieres or leave a comment below and I'll do my darndest to find the ones that stand out. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube, infecting the airwaves with our intoxicating presence. 500 is done. How long to a thousand? And one last time listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them. Duskglad will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a video about emperor penguins, eat something spicy, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow with the window open and the stars twinkling down on you. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart, a reminder to be better today than you were yesterday. You matter. You are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. <laughs>